Freedom and censorship can't exist in the same world. And that's true whether it's the government or private corporations who do the censoring. Hi, I'm Ron Coleman, and welcome to the Coleman Nation podcast. It's a show where I sit down with guests to discuss the future of free expression and thought in our interconnected world. Here, we will focus on issues involving social media, cancel culture, and free expression that everybody who cares about ideas or freedom should be wrestling with. Hey, folks, it's Ron Coleman. I am so excited today. And if you think I say that every day, every time you hear me, you might be right. This is one of the times I'm telling you the truth. Ah, Sora Bomari. Okay, that's who I've got on today. And you know, I don't usually give a lot of bio, spend a lot of time of, uh, of our podcast giving you the biographical rundown. I assume that you come to class prepared. But Saurabh is just one of these multi-tool players. Right now, he's working as op-ed editor for the New York Post. He just published a new book that I have found fascinating, although I have not finished it, The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of a Tradition in an Age of Chaos. And I think it's a great framework for what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about, in, you know, Saurabh's thinking and, his, and what's going on and all this stuff as it applies ultimately to free speech and and cancel culture and social media and all the things, all the things we usually talk about. But Sora, welcome. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Ron, for making the time. Oh, it's really a pleasure. I have watched the development of your online persona with great interest. And I think to some extent, would you not agree that perhaps Notwithstanding all the stupidity and garbage that one has to wade through on places like Twitter, that there is nonetheless an opportunity for people to develop into or, or to restore the institution of the public intellectual that I think didn't exist 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, I, I occasionally have these bursts of um these tantrums of I'm going to leave Twitter forever. Why am I, <laughs> why am I enriching Jack Dorsey for, you know, essentially doing free labor, labor that doesn't necessarily bring me anything, but, but makes him richer anyway. And, and, and waiting through, as you said, the toxicity, but on the whole, I've found, I mean, I've made connections with people I otherwise wouldn't um, meet, um, not least yourself and, and lots of others. And, you know, frankly, I enjoy the the banter with um, followers as well. At least not the ones who aren't abusive. You know, I have a very quick uh, trigger finger for blocking anyway. But um, the ones who aren't abusive and and just um, you know build a rapport with you, and I don't just mean like fellow writers. I'm talking about ordinary people who are just on Twitter. I enjoy it. So um, you know, yeah, on the whole, although it does waste a lot of time during the day, it does. But you know, I, I think to some extent we we often posit a, an ideal efficiency world. You know, when we consider how much time we spend on social media, without necessarily asking ourselves what actually what did we really do with those other minutes, those you know during the, that other time. And 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 here you've got, after all, a book to sell, and you've got a career to to promote, and especially you know in an environment where essentially only one side is meaningfully represented in the mainstream media. If you don't sell your wares on social media, you're going to have a really hard time selling them anywhere. Oh, that's right. That's right. And especially you, you, you've touched a third rail of American, and this is an, an, an ancient problem of American cultural intolerance by becoming a, a Catholic and being loud and proud about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you talked about abusive stuff on, on, on Twitter. I knew exactly what kind of abusive stuff you're talking about. Yes, yes. I think um, for good and ill, I'm an intellectual convert. That is, I, you know, I was an atheist or declared myself an atheist when I was 13 years old. I was living in the Ayatollah's Iran at the time. That's a, an entirely different story. Right. You can get into it. And then, you know, through the grace of God, but also through kind of reading and reasoning, reading the Bible, reading Pope Benedict, I, I 
um, became convinced that there is a God and a personal God um, who has entered human history. And when you make a conversion like that, then um, it's not just a part of your cultural background, you know, like uh, as it is for a lot of what, what we call credo Catholics, you know, ethnic Irish, ethnic Italian. It's just part of the faith. In a way, I, I, in some ways for those folks, the faith is, is more deeply rooted, but it also means that um, um, they don't necessarily need to kind of make the apologetic arguments in the public square um, or they don't feel the need to. Whereas if you've made a kind of public conversion like mine, um, then you feel compelled to, to defend what you've done, defend the faith. And so, yes. And I, I got to say, as I mean, as a, as, a, as a Christian, in that sense too, Twitter has been a great um, evangelization mechanism for people like me, you know, who want to share religious ideas. No, I mean, I hear a lot of what you're in what you're saying now that reverberates in things that I saw in, in, your, in your book. And when I sent you that, I guess it was an email a few days ago telling you, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't get over this book. It was a moment of what, what we lawyers and you're one of us, um, call an excited utterance, I, which means that you, it might be admissible. Yeah. <laughs> um, because what I was reading, see, what you described yourself as an intellectual convert and someone who, by virtue of having made that journey for yourself, you're more inclined or perhaps motivated or perhaps able to defend that decision and, to, and the faith community, let's call it, using these our 21st century mush words, they, so they, do, have, they do have certain conven, convenient Uses. aspects to them. Yeah, they're very ecumenical. Now it's time to turn the, the, the interview to about me, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you why it's going to be worth it. Um, I did not grow up Orthodox. I came from the sort of Jewishly identifying background that you describe among those sort of uh, credo Catholics, as you call them. And by virtue of becoming not only Orthodox, but in the category of, of what's considered to be, I like to use this term, strictly Orthodox. I don't think Haredi is appropriate for me because I'm, I'm not that religious, to tell you the truth. But that's the community that I identify with, sort of, in, in, if I may be forgiven the, the comparison, just as you identify with the Pope, you're not claiming to be as religious as the Pope, but he's the guy. Right. He's the guy. So my guys are our are, are our religious leaders who are the most accomplished and the most erudite and the most holy. So you're you're Baal Tshuva. Is that the term? I am about the Shuva. That's right. That's exactly right. And as I was looking through your book, I was I was just so so much resonated with me, and the idea of the unbroken thread. You know, one of the things I talk about with my friends frequently is how. Catholicism has in it, you know, for, for all the aspects of any Christianity that are fundamentally theologically incompatible with Judaism, I mean, that's an axiomatic statement, but Catholicism, there's a certain respect that will always be accorded to Catholicism because it not only is the closest um, offspring from Judaism among the existing Christian churches. Yes. I'm sure that somebody in the Eastern Orthodox Church would take issue with that, but well, they're not probably listening. But there's also this concept in Christianity, and, and this goes to the title of your book, or, or rather to, in Roman Catholicism, of tradition, of an oral law, so to speak, that, you know, and I remember when I was in college and I first read that unlike Protestants, Catholics especially in medieval times, were not supposed to read the Bible because it was understood that if you just open up a Bible and read it, if you're literate enough to read it and you read it, whether in the Vulgate or if you're even literate enough to read it in Hebrew and Greek, as the case may be in Aramaic, you're going to blow it. <laughs> you can't possibly understand it by just reading it literally because you need a received tradition of what terms mean. 
And that's the concept of the oral law in Judaism. And, and it's something that Catholicism has. And it's something that Protestantism obviously discarded. And, and I think there's a great deal of tension in American culture where there's this great independent, the sense of, of independence. I mean, I'm, I think my next interview is with Michael Malice, who might be the anti Sorabamari. But you know, I'm personally very fond of him. And there's nothing not to like. He's such a, he, and I am also. Sweet guy. Intention with his last name. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Not, no malice whatsoever, but malice toward not in charity to all. And he's intoxicated with the idea of freedom. Uh, whatever that means. He's, he considers himself an anarchist, I think. And one of your chapters is about what is really the value? Is free thinking everything the Reformation told us it's supposed to be? Well, so it's in a very American idea. You're, you are an exile from, from a theocracy. He's an exile from a sort of different kind of theocracy, which is a totalitarian political theocracy. His response after exposure to a quasi-religious a youth here in America was, I, I want to go all the way to non-control, to personal, maximum personal autonomy. And your response is, I don't believe that, tell, tell me if I, if, if I got this wrong, but the, the way Catholicism and similarly Judaism approach the question is, we are individuals and we, we should have, we have our intellectual faculties, but we have to acknowledge that we don't have access to all the wisdom about all the things in, in the world. Yeah. So I think I, th I think that's part of the thing that bothers Americans about Catholicism. I don't think that I, you know when people talk about whether or not Joe Biden can can get communion. I, I think the percentage of non-Catholics who know what communion actually means mm -hmm. can't be more than twenty percent. But they do know there's something they really don't like about Catholicism, which is that it's there's something un-American or perhaps un-Anglo-Saxon about it. Yeah, it's this, um, you know, in the chapter on the, that you referred to, should you think for yourself, which is a provocative thing to pose in, in its own right. I should, I should note for, for your listeners who, who don't have an idea of, of, of the book, just to set up what the, the, Please do. the framing Please, device yeah. is, basically. It's a book I wrote for my son, um, Max. He's now four years old. He was two when I started writing the book. And... Um, Basically, um, to, to bring in Michael Malice, you know, we, we do have this similar backgrounds where we left essentially tyrannical lawless states. Right. And we came to the United States. And I'm, I very much, I'm the grateful immigrant. And, you know, there, I, I, I have no other, there is no other home. This is it. And so I care about it a lot. Um, nevertheless, despite that gratitude, or perhaps because of that gratitude, I'm also worried about the direction that our civilization is taking and worried about how that might um, shape, or should I say misshape, Max, my son. And so in order to inoculate him against some of the uh, excesses or sort of this, the, the destructive drive in the misuses of American freedom, let's say, yeah. in order to inoculate him against that or prepare him or point him to a different way, I decided to write this book. and. You know, I'm not a theologian. Uh, I'm not a. I'm not a philosopher. I'm. I'm a journalist and a storyteller. So in order to, to do that, I pose these kind of unasked questions or questions that, our liberal, secular, kind of individualistic, technocratic, reigning ideology says these questions have been, either answered or they've been supplanted by, more scientific and technical questions. But at any rate, they're they've been resolved or they're not worth posing anymore. Uh -huh. When in fact. You know, they're eminently um, pertinent still to, to a, a truly free and happy life. And so I pose those questions, but instead of giving my own answers, I explore each through the life of one great thinker. Um, and they're not all Catholic. In fact, only about, uh, you know, a fourth are Catholic. There's um, also Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, whom we can talk about. That, that was fascinating. The great kind of Hasidic uh, mystic and, and theologian of the mid 20th century. Um, there's uh, um, Hans Jonas, the, he was an agnostic uh, Jewish philosopher, German Jewish philosopher, um, who um, 
who was a student of Heidegger and ultimately a great critic of Heidegger and, and what he saw as a recurrence of ancient Gnosticism in Heidegger's modern philosophy. There is Andrea Dworkin, the radical feminist, um, who is, and it's the most sort of, most of the chapters have this sort of hagiographic quality where I'm only praise the subjects because they're kind of eminent life. I would say Dworkin is the one where I suggest she, she was onto something, but ultimately the answers that she offered were not the right ones to the problems that she correctly identified at any rate. So it's a book of questions, and then those questions are explored through these um, biographies. It's a genre I sort of created because there are books of questions and there are books of biographical profiles. And I sort of put those two together is the contribution of this book. Um, and, and so when the reader reads it, it you're not hit thick with philosophy. Um, it, you know, you're, you, there's a narrative, there's a beginning, middle, and end, and the ideas are sort of naturally interwoven into the narratives. The question, now to get, sorry, that was a digressive, no, that's okay. We can do that. This is long form. <laughs> the question on, on authority is the one, I think, as you said, that runs contrary probably to, to at least an important strand in American life. And it does have theological roots. And that has to do with the fact that Americans, as a famous saying goes, kind of put the protest in, in Protestantism. I know Protestant, actually, that's, that, that's not what the term means. It's not like you're protesting, but, but that this specific strand of Protestantism, Protestantism especially that, that took root in the United States, you know, you can call it Puritanism or you call it nonconformist Christianity, right. was extremely hostile to religious establishments and to religious authority. And... Um, urged people, obviously, you know, as, as all the Reformation thinkers did, to, to read the Bible on their own and for each person to be his own interpreted key and therefore to think for yourself. And that idea went from the theological, which obviously as a Catholic I would dispute, but that's a different realm. But then we dilated it to expand to the whole of life, that in every domain you should think for yourself and to try to unshackle yourself from, you know, existing authorities, tradition, unproved kind of presuppositions, dogma, and, and reason through every dilemma on your, own, on your own, that's a very American idea. So you constantly hear, you know, think for yourself, think for yourself. And the, the argument in that chapter is, can you really think for yourself given the point that you made, Ron, which is that, you know, our minds are, if you agree that there's something broken about human nature, um, that there are limits to what we can know, and we're, swayed this way and that by all sorts of external pressures, as well as internal ones, like our own baser drives or appetites. Um, so there's a, there is a purpose to authority, to right, rightly understood authority. And that really that freedom of conscience that Americans cherish can only be freedom of a true conscience if the conscience reflects the dictates of some universal moral law, whether that's the, the Decalogue or whether that's, um, you know, natural law, some, some that, that, that law that's written in the human heart that, that tells you that there's an objective moral order, that there's right and wrong. If conscience becomes this thing where it's like, well, I, you know, I think it's okay to terminate children in the womb in, in month nine of pregnancy. And so, so you may disagree and no one can say for sure which of our two consciences is in the right. If that becomes the case, then that's not really conscious anymore. It's completely subjectivized. It's completely relativized. So what prevents that from happening? Well, it's authority. It's, a, it's, it's these established authorities like scripture, like the papacy, um, like classical antiquity, like the lessons of the rabbis um, and, the, and the Jewish sages. It's those kinds of things that kind of guide the conscience so that it doesn't go off. And, um, but you're right that it's, it is, I, I, I openly admit it's, it's, it's intention with something in American culture, which is very anti-authority. And I, of course you, you, you're also a living paradox to some ex extent because you decided to think for yourself and, and not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things when I was in Asia Torah, the famous, um, outreach yeshiva in Israel for Americans was one of my teachers, Rabbi Mati Berger, said, uh, quoted someone you know, who said, maybe you know who it is, the idea of having an open mind is to decide 
what to put in it before you are satisfied that now it's time to close it. In other words, you you can accept, and if you if you learn about intellectual history, you find that the greatest thinkers, including many who really became famous as for, for their heterodoxy, later in life came around to a much more conservative point of view, including theologically, and settled in with that. But you went from, a, you know, you you were born into a tradition. You ejected it and became a secular teenager, sort of in a, in a way following that rather facile axiom that if you're not a liberal when you're a teenager, you, you're heartless. And if you're not a conservative when you're an adult, you're, you're brainless, something like that. And then you had this, what sounds like a fairly rapid exposure to Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, and accepted it as a tradition. In other words, you left your tradition twice over. We have this, this inherent problem that if we're going to appeal to authority and receive traditions, and this, this is, goes back, this is essentially the underlying culture war issue. And this is the, this is the 1619 question and all the whole American identity. Actually, I was speaking to Tim Poole earlier this week. It's a, to some extent, it's an issue of identitarianism as much as, you know, criti so-called critical racial, racial, racial studies. What's that tradition? Even, you know, let's put aside the question of, of Americans and, and their bristling at theological traditions, even to the extent that we hearken back, as certainly the founding fathers did, to a political and moral tradition, which has in it this sort of built-in acknowledgement of the grandeur of antiquity that you just referred to, and of classical thinking, which the Catholic Church, far more than Judaism, took a large part of in developing its worldview. But how do we argue? Because we're all, every single guest on this podcast agrees, if we don't fix the culture, there's nothing Ron Coleman and his partners and colleagues can do in the courts that's going to stop this decline towards a lack of liberty and illiberalism. How do we convince people that there's a legitimacy to the Western canon and its theological foundations when there's so few people believe in the first place. They have so much trouble with this concept of religious faith. What a long question. And, and a very good one. Um, I just want to briefly note that, yeah, I mean, this is, um, this is a quick digression, but um, it's very fond of Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs's books. And when, when he passed away, I wrote a little tribute, a Catholic tribute to Rabbi Sachs. And I did note, though, that difference that you mentioned, which is that, um, that, that Judaism did not, not, not nearly to the same extent, incorporate kind of Greco-Roman philosophy into its system as it developed in history um, after its encounter with these kind of Hellenistic civilizations, whereas the Catholic Church obviously made philosophy its own, made Greek philosophy its own, and then, you know, and it's, at least in its own claim, attempted to purify it through faith. And so that you have this synthesis of faith and philosophy that's the foundation of the, of, of the West. Anyway, that's a side point. Um, how, do we, how do we fix the, what you're addressing? I sometimes feel very despondent, you know, for set, set, aside, set aside divine revelation, set aside, you know, what, what God in the Hebrew Bible tells us, for example, about, um, about uh, marriage. Just talk about the, at the level of natural law. One of my friends, um, you maybe actually follow him on Twitter. He goes under a pseudonym. His pseudonym is Rafael Ariazaga. Oh, sure. Yeah. He wrote a wonderful little essay about the law of matrimony. And he doesn't necessarily mean just the law of matrimony, again, from a Judeo-Christian perspective, but that nearly all ancient civilizations, although there were variations at the margins, Islam, <laughs> you know, Chinese uh, culture, Roman law, certainly, and then you have Christ Judaism and Christianity, had this idea that, that marriage is of such paramount importance 
and that the sex drive, although it's wonderful and it, it, it um, is unitive of man and woman and so forth, can be so destructive that it has to be channeled into the realm of marriage and nowhere else. They, they, in various ways, they all attempted to set up these guardrails against it. And what Raphael was telling me, it's like, he, you know, what he wrote would have been, would have been so sort of obvious to, right. to Aquinas and to Maimonides and to Averroes and to, you know. And to, and to the pagans. And the pagans, pagans, exactly, exactly. And so Caesar's wife has to be above suspicion. What? Wife? He's a pagan. He was married. Suspicion? What's the issue here? This is, and so with it, with what you pose it to our many of our fellow countrymen, and you know the way I put it to him, or put, I, he put it to my camera, but it feels sometimes it feels like you are a Martian and speaking this strange language, <laughs> which is just the language of you know again classical civilization, Judeo-Christian civilization. You're like, but they they look at you. You're like, huh? Mm -hmm. And so that those moments make me despondent. Now, in answer to what to do about it, I think what I and a few others in this cohort of mainly Catholic, but not exclusively Catholic, um, kind of rising conservatives have proposed is precisely that, that it's what you do and what uh, lawyers and civil servants and essentially anyone who's engaged in shaping law that matters more than perhaps shaping the culture or rather that, I mean, this is in response to the old conservative nostrum that politics is downstream from culture. I think we, and I, when I say we, I'm including you know, people like Josh Hammer at Newsweek, Adrian Vermeule, my friend at Harvard Law School, Patrick Deneen, where it seems to me to say that, to say that culture is downstream from politics is not really not, it's not true, Again, I have to uh, appeal to ancient authorities here where, um, you know, Aristotle, Cicero, everyone says that law is a teacher and that every statesman, see, every statesman or stateswoman seeks to, to shape his people. And how do you do that? You do it through law because mere exhortations to virtue aren't enough because they don't have the component of um, kind of St. Thomas says they're not efficacious because they don't have a, a disciplinary kind of authoritative component. And we also see how much changes in law have changed the culture. Things that were you know, unthinkable then become legal. And then within five years, not five years, sometimes a year, you know, people quote unquote evolve and they won't even remember that a year ago they held the contrary position. It's not that I believe then that necessarily that uh, politics is upstream from culture or culture is upstream from politics, that the two are in this dynamic uh, union and so, Yes, we have to address cultural issues, but, um, but politics and law are very, very important. And so if, I do think if we can change the law um, so that it's a little bit more responsive to human nature, again, nature, not just as, as, as the, the kind of kind of scientific worldview that just says human beings are, are selfish and horrible and just animals, but human nature as, as the kind of classical and Christian tradition understood it as human beings are actually rational and that they, they, they really thrive when they're um, exercise their rational faculties toward becoming more virtuous. If you support that process at the level of law, you can, you can perhaps change the culture, which is the challenge you are uh, concerned with and I'm concerned with as well. That is a really great insight. And it's the first time I've, I've really heard it put that way. I will tell you, though, from my personal experience that I remember when I was privileged to be part of the team that won the um, In Re uh, or, or Mattel versus Tam in the, in the Supreme Court, the, the trademark case for the slants. And I remember saying to numerous reporters, uh, my hope is that as a result of the language in this decision about the constitutional, the fact that under the constitution, there is no category of speech that makes, it's called hate speech and hate speech is not treated, is, is not entitled to any less protection than any other kind of speech. That language referred to what the government may or may not censor. 
or may or may not restrict. But I would hope the law being a teacher, not words that I use, but I'm just stealing them from you right now, that perhaps the campus censors and the social media censors will take note. And I was gravely disappointed. It had, didn't make the slightest dent whatsoever in their thinking, although I do think this, that is a somewhat different issue from the one you're talking about. Things have only gotten worse since the Slans case in terms of, uh, you know, lib uh, free speech and, and, and liberty in, in these private or non-governmental contexts. Yeah, I mean, I think um, here's another problem to which the, the classical and, and Judeo-Christian tradition had an answer, which is that, which we've forgotten, which is that um, private tyranny is as dangerous and in, in some ways, maybe more dangerous and pub, as public tyranny. And we're very accustomed, and, and the entire American order is set up to try to restrain public tyrannies. That is to say, governmental tyranny. And you know, some of that is very is to the good. It, you know, it means we have um, we go very far before depriving people of their due process rights or fundamental uh, human dignity, and that's that's all to the good. But um, if we lose sight of the possibility that private actors can also become tyrannical, like whether that's uh, you know big tech or you know large employers or really the tyranny of the individual, private individual over his own self, for example, through uh, addiction to pornography or opioids, we have much less of a language and a and a kind of conceptual framework for dealing with private tyranny. I agree, and, and in fact, I've been, you know, that's the fatal flaw that I think is, has really undermined the libertarian project uh, in our time is, you know, we'll build your own Twitter. You, how can you not recognize that corporations, just because the left said it before we conservatives said it, doesn't make it not true. Corporations have become the de facto state and they are controlling your lives. And the fact that right now you're not the one being censored, you know, should not blind you to the fact that censorship is, is a social evil, regardless of whether it's imposed by a putatively democratic government or so-called, a, a, let's just say a putatively private company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it becomes a, it's such a formal, a meaningless formal distinction, and I, I get very frustrated, as I think you do, when um, you know the, the the inquiry begins and ends what over these kind of debates over censorship. It, for some of uh, some folks on our side, um, the inquiry begins and ends as to whether it's a private actor doing it, and if it's pri it is. If it is, then well, that's it. That's the end of the inquiry. It, uh, you know, you there. You go. Build your own Facebook, build your own Twitter. But now, but now I'm going to come full circle, and I think we've already answered this question to some extent, but it's a, it's a dicey one, which is that both your historic religious leadership and mine don't endorse, neither of them endorses free speech as such, in the absolutist sense, even free, free thought, as you put it. Obviously, famously, the Catholic Church had its and has, I think, its index. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's, it was... Um, it, they retired it? Yeah, they, it was retired. They re um, retired the index? mid-century, I think, either just before or after the Second Vatican Council. But is it not, the, but I would imagine still that there are things that a, that a good Catholic knows he has no business reading or certainly looking at. Sure, and, and especially, I think, in, um, in, religious communities, you know, like, and I'm talking, you know, uh, you know let's say seminaries or, or um, monasteries and so forth, you know, there are certain things that if you, if you do want to read, you should do that under the guidance of a religious superior and with, it, with, with his approval. So sure, yeah. And no, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm, you know, maybe, maybe you and I disagree on this, but I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not a free speech absolutist. I, I think some of the, and I, think, and I think even on a kind of originalist reading, some of the free speech absolutism that our libertarian friends embrace, even as they also give so much credence to claims of private power, um, 
are retconning, you know, in this country, at, you know, as you know better than I do, you know, into the into the 19th century, we had blasphemy prosecutions. Um, I, remember, I forget the name of the case, but it was um, the Chancellor Kent ruling in, in New York State in, mm-hmm. in the 19th century. It's, um, I forget the name of the case, but... Uh, Me too. But at any rate, you know, and, and certainly we've always had obscenity, um, common law obscenity provisions, and then the federal one has, is still there on the books, technically. It's on the books. It, it, it is astonishing to me, and I actually once wrote a very long thread about, and people don't realize that the Postal Service used to... Open mail. <laughs> ...impose <laughs> censorship. <laughs> that was their job. Now, they, now they're in charge of, 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 of voter fraud, of course, of course. But no, I'm not, I'm not a free speech absolutist, although right now the fight is in that direction. I agree. I agree. And so as a defensive maneuver, exactly. Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm there. And, and certainly, look, I mean, I think because we at the New York Post just went through this ordeal uh, over the Hunter Biden story. Oh, my goodness. You know, to me, uh, there is no conflict, by the way, between my faith as it's summarized in the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the work of, for example, exposing Hunter Biden, you know, that the, the catechism does you know, kind of view as a, as a, as a noble endeavor to try to um, shed light into dark places that, and, and to root out graft, which is an offense against the common good of the country. That's perfectly from, let alone a constitutional point of view, but from a Catholic point of view, it's, it's legitimate and honorable work. You know, to, to not be a free speech absolutist is not to then turn around and say that, uh, there is no role for this kind of journalism. You know, I want to live in a closed society when where powerful people get away with doing whatever they want to do. Yeah, um, I mean, journalism in and of itself is, is is particularly an awkward concept in Judaism because of the our rules against tailbearing. Interesting. Yes, yes. It it is very very awkward and far beyond the scope of our conversation now. But it, luckily, not luckily. Because of our sins, <laughs> we, 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 are, we are in exile everywhere. So the, the news gets out regardless of, of, of what we want to do about it. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's really important for, for people to, to, you know, to, to think about these issues. And I wish they, they would look at more, at more of your work and understand how an intellectual uh, and, a, and a person with all the choice in the world can come to terms with uh, submitting himself to a theological and philosophical doctrine that, first of all, governs how you live your life. You know, not just it's a box you check off. I've got blonde hair. I'm Jewish. Um, I'm five foot ten. But rather, I and this is something I, I remember. I was struck by it when I was re- when I read it in in Will Durant of all places, describing the Pharisees you know, at the time of the mission or the, the time of Jesus as religion was everything to these guys, to the, to, the, to the Jews, they really, like, pagans didn't get it. This was serious business. They really meant, if I just had a, an argument with some guy on Twitter earlier in the week, and people say to me, Ron, why do you bother? And I always explain, I'm not doing it for him. I'm doing it for the other 130,000 people who are following me and who might want to know how to address these issues, who had said in a conversation to somebody else, well, Leviticus is, no one fo- follows Leviticus anymore. So excuse me. Excuse me, <laughs> Well, and, and you know, I, I love it. You just said the pagans didn't get it. I mean, you, in, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, there's the, this wonderful moment where, you know, obviously, Saul, Paul is, is in conflict with, with Jewish communities in Achaia, in, in, in the Penapolis in Greece. And they, they, you know, they come before the, the, the local con- consul who happens to be, the, the brother brother of the philosopher Seneca, this was Gallio, and they come in front of him, and he just says like, ah, "This is this is between you and your own law, <laughs> you know. Like, I, I can't rule on this. Just you you figure it out yourselves." I just think that's that's a very kind of the, the attitude of, of a lot of pagans of, in response to the rise of Christianity and in the, re, the response of the, you know, kind of conflict between seemingly different strands of Judaism to them, uh, with this kind of new sect that proclaimed the Messiah and these others who rejected it. And, and the pagans are just like, ah, <laughs> what is this stuff about? You, you deal with it yourselves. <laughs> That's right. That's right. 
Well, Saurabh, you know, we could we could definitely do this all day, and I think we're going to have to find another occasion to do it, if not here, somewhere else. Can, can I say just one thing, though, one, one point? No, you can say very th you can say actually three things. No, 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 two, just very quickly. Seriously. Because I, <laughs> I, I, I answered something kind of, again, digressive instead of your main point, which is which is something that you do. And think I, you think I remember your main point? I don't think anyone else does, but say, say what's on your mind. No, 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 not no paying just, extra. just in the sense that you said, um, you know, that how can someone who, who is an intellectual, I, I always cringe to apply that label to myself. I'm just a, a tabloid hack who, who works at a newspaper where we do like <laughs> a prurient headline like, and pun. Headless body and topless bar, right. You work for the New York Post. <laughs> so so I, I try not to adopt that label too much, but at any rate, submit to, Kind of a theological system and i think this is certainly true of christians and, and and devout jews as well that it's actually very relaxing it is very relaxing to say oh okay there's this path that was that is set out for me it stretches out behind me and it goes this way forward and i can leap at life in it with a kind of sense of safety and guardrails as opposed to every day waking up and having to um reinvent the moral wheel for yourself or you know, kind of solipsistically examine your interior and be like, what, what do I really believe? Who am I? That these questions, you know, the great traditions, that answers are set out in a way. I mean, there's discovery, there's, there's reasoning about it, but you're not- And there's growth. You're, you're required to keep, you're required to keep growing. And absolutely, absolutely. But it's so much more, that, that process is so much more, in a way, as hard as it can be, because you fail to live up to them and then you have a sense of guilt and you have to, Nevertheless, the whole process is a lot more, I think, relaxing than to have to, uh, again, to reinvent yourself every day. And that's the that's really the promise of tradition and, and the argument I try to make in The Unbroken Thread, that the limitations of tradition are ultimately paradoxically liberating and the lack of those limits can be imprisoning. Well, you also spend a, a, a good amount of time on, on Solzhenitsyn. And I was, I, when I was in college, I read everything that was in translation in, from Solzhenitsyn at the time um, as part of a Solzhenitsyn course, except the Gulag because that would take up the whole school year. So instead I decided to read the Gulag during exam period in law school. That's how serious a student I was. And one of that one of the things Solzhenitsyn, I, I mean, look, he's not by any stretch of the imagination the first person to say this. Augustine says it, it, it you know, it, it, but as a as a as a modern, he demonstrates so powerfully how when you have when you have nothing, but you have faith, you are the freest person in the world. And they can't take anything from you anymore. And that's an incredibly, you know, I mean, it's striking how foreign this is to the predominant way of thinking about the world today. You also, you also encounter it in Natan Sharansky's wonderful uh, biography, autobiography, uh, see, is it See No Evil? Fear no, Fear no Evil. You know, he's in this cell uh, in the gulag, you know, negative 30s temperature, getting fed like, 20 calories a day or whatever it is. But he has, he has uh, you know, Rabbi Nachman's famous saying, you know, the whole world is a bridge. And the, and the point is just to not be afraid. Uh, and that carries him through. God is waiting at the other end of the bridge, more or less. And um, who are these, you know, communist apparatchiks compared to the Almighty? That's that. What you're, but, 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 what you're saying, what you said, you know, when you, when you swung back and closed the, Close the loop there that I'd forgotten we'd left open. Is it plays right into a well-known trope of non-believers, uh, which is, well, yeah, it's great to it's great to latch onto a religious tradition because then everything's so easy. Then it's you've got it all figured out and you don't and you don't have to struggle anymore. And of course, how many of them are actually struggling? They're not struggling. If you, if you told me that you, know, that, you know, that you were in the process of spending, uh, you know, 18 months deeply exposing yourself to every, every religious and, the, and philosophical tradition in the world, 
and I'm not doing that because I because I decided to become a Baal Tshuva, uh, I would hear that. But nonetheless, it is something you hear all the time. Well, it's a, yeah, you got It's now it's easy for you. Follow this formula: seven Hail Marys, fourteen, uh, you know, uh, Our Fathers, and and there you you fix the problem. And they, it, people have a, and this is also part of our Protestant heritage. Americans have a gigantic problem understanding that, that metaphysics are for real. That that this, if, if you will grant me, as you must, because if, if you don't, we're not having the conversation at all. That God created the heaven and the earth and the universe, okay, and therefore can do anything. Then God absolutely can say that if you eat matzah during Passover, it's not just a thing; it's a thing. I said that if you're Jewish and you, and, and, I mean, if you don't, if, if you eat leavened bread during Passover, yeah, that's a sin. No, but I didn't hurt anyone. No, 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 no. God has these instructions. He gave you an instruction manual and you don't have to understand it, but this is how it works. The idea that there are these things that you're, I, I do submit myself to saying, I'm not going to understand at a certain level. I'm not going to understand and that's okay. But I know it's okay. Why? Because I'm buying into the whole system. But as, as you point out, you have to, you're nonetheless still spending your life searching and growing and trying to become a better person with, within that system. Amen. Well, now I'm going to go back to that wrap up again. It's been a, ter a tremendous uh, conversation. And I, I think we even managed to be topical. And uh, I thank you so much for spending time with me. I'm looking forward to finishing the book. And I uh, hope we get a chance to chat again soon. I really enjoyed that, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. So long. Okay. Be well. Hey, thank you for listening to the Coleman Nation podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. If you like the show, please rate it five stars and leave a review. For more information, please visit the show's website at coleman-nation.com. That's coleman-nation.com or you can visit my blog at likelihoodofconfusion.com. Join us next time on the Coleman Nation podcast and have a great day.